Okay, we're live. Welcome to the podcast, Steve. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jamie. So, uh, for people that might not know you, um, so what's your name? Uh, Steve Clan. Cool. And uh, how old are you? I am 32. 32 years old. And you live out in the uh, Cayuga area of uh, Ontario. Would that be correct? Yeah, out in the boonies, kind of near Hamilton and out in the country. Cool. Where'd you grow up? Uh, I grew up in Caledonia, so not uh, not too far away from where I am now. Ah, cool. Just moved down the road. Right on. So uh, just want to uh, have a conversation here about uh, your flying career and uh, where you started and the things that you uh, – the different jobs you had and whatnot uh, through your flying career. Um, and you started pretty young, I guess, didn't you? Uh, yeah. Um, I guess it all kind of goes back to, uh, um, air cadets when I was 12. Oh, uh, and that's kind of where it all started. So can you sort of walk us through your progression as like a, a licensed pilot? Like, uh, when did you get a, did you have a rec permit or something like that before you had a private pilot's license or how did that all work? Um, so, uh, through the cadet program, I got my gliders license, uh, was, was the first one that I, uh, I had. <clears throat> so I think I actually got that when I was, um, I had just turned 17 when I got my glider license. Right. And then the uh, the next year, I had gone on to do, um, uh, let's see, glider at 17, private at 18, commercial at ni- 19, instructor by 20. Cool. So where did you, uh, where did you get your uh, glider license? Um, so that was up in uh, Mountain View in Picton. Um in the air cadet program the, the 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 flying courses for ontario you, you stay in belleville at loyalist college uh, okay and i was there for 10 eight, eight weeks 10 weeks and uh did all my flying then came home with a with a glider license cool did you did you enjoy it have you been in a glider since yeah so yeah, i loved it uh, gliding is uh, definitely an interesting uh, way to start um, to to start your flying. Um, but yeah, like I, I enjoyed that a lot actually. And then uh, um, you do your glider course in the summer, and then most cadet, you know, I know there's a, a gliding school for each region. So on weekends, you would go and do cadet gliding where uh um i would take up other air cadets and uh, take them on like famil flights uh doing that so Hmm. cool so yeah i I did that between 17 and 18 in in st Catharines and welland doing uh, gliding cool and then you got your ppl and that wasn't through like air cadets or anything was it no i did my ppl on my own um when I graduated school, like high school, I was looking at um, where I wanted to go, and I, I got accepted to the biggest, you know, uh, Confed up in uh, Thunder Bay, and I got accepted to um, the school in Toronto and whatnot. And then I decided, you know, I, I'm just gonna. I live in Caledonia, and Hamilton Airport is ten minutes away, and uh, I'm just gonna do my flying then. You know, in hindsight, you know, maybe a, a degree in business aviation would have been nice. But then I looked at, at it as, you know, um, most programs were two and a half, three and a half years. And uh, from start of my PPL to end of my commercial was just under a year. Oh, wow. Um including multi and night. So it's, I kind of just hammered down and flew a lot. 
you know, and any day the, the sun was shining and like, Oh, Hey, you know, I call up my instructor and, uh, Hey, can we get a, a lesson in today? And yeah, I kind of just pounded through it really quick. And did you get your instrument rating before you got your commercial pilot's license or did you do it afterwards? I did it afterwards. I think this will come up in the suggestions for other people. <laughs> <laughs> so would you, do you think you'd recommend doing it, uh, like during your 200 hour, uh, commercial pilot regulation uh, or hour requirement, or would you recommend doing it after in hindsight? Um, I don't know about either of those because I waited until I was over a thousand hours to do my IFR. Oh, okay. Um, I would su- I would suggest doing it right away. Now, if you, if I know if you can fit it in your hours, because there is a lot of training in that two hundred hours. But if you can fit your IFR in and that two hundred, then do it for sure. What did I have? I think I had twelve hundred hours by the time I finished my IFR, just because I was instructing and uh, I waited late to get it done, but it definitely held me back. Right. Um, I'm sure you drew on some of your experience, though, to help you get through some of that. Uh, you know, your IFR rating as well. I'm sure you had much better control of the aircraft with with a thousand hours than you would at say 150, where a lot of students would be you know, trying to get their IFR ticket. Uh, yeah, that, that's true. Um, you know, I had been an instructor for years and teaching instrument flying. So I was pretty well, uh, um, I I was, I was pretty okay with it, (laughs) with, uh, with doing the IFR that late. Cool. Um, all right. So, um, so you got your PPL, uh, then you got, uh, your multi night rating and obviously your CPL. And then, uh, so your first job was as an instructor. Would that be yes. correct? Cool. So, yeah. uh, where did you, where were you instructing? Um, so my first job was instructing at uh, Hamilton at Peninsula Air, which is where I did all of my flight training um, back in, I think, 2007, 2008. And they no longer exist? What did they do? No, they, uh, <laughs> fl- yeah, flight schools have a habit of closing down. Mm. Um, I did bounce around um, a little bit because uh, originally I'd gone out to Gander, Newfoundland to do my instructor rating and then uh, as contracts. So that was to teach um, Chinese nationals. Uh, they would come here for their license. And so I went out there to get my to get my instructor rating and then to teach them. And then their contract had fell through. And so then they really didn't need instructors. So then I came back to Ontario. Mm. Uh, I only taught at Peninsula Air for a limited time before there was there 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 had been a uh, um, an issue between the operator of the airport. You know they didn't really want general aviation. They wanted to clear. They wanted to demolish the hangars and make room for cargo. So right. Peninsula Air closed down three months after I started working there. Oh, wow. So what <laughs> year I, would this have been? Yeah, and then I moved to... Uh, uh, so this was 2008, I believe. All right. So do you oh, recall maybe what o- the maybe industry o- was seven? like back then? Um, uh, I, I'd say good. Uh, you know, like I, I recall there being being lots of uh, jobs on Av Canada and there being lots of instructor jobs being available. So, mm. right. Oh, cool. All right. So, um, so after you instructed, you instructed to, I think you were saying about a thousand hours or so, would that be accurate? Uh, yeah. And then what? Talk me through your, your, the different flying jobs you had yeah. after instructing. Well, let's see. After instructing, um, I had moved moved around, and eventually, I was the uh, the CFI of a flight school in British Columbia. Okay. Um, 
and I was out there for four years. Now, actually, my um, the flying had gotten slow. They were bringing in another instructor to run the school, so I actually let my instructor rating uh, expire. And I didn't. I, I I had met at that time. She's now my wife, and uh, so I was living with her on the coast. And I didn't really feel like coming back to Ontario. So I just lived out there and I was actually working as a scuba diver and uh, search and rescue for uh, two or three years, um, staying out there until I eventually, uh, at that time, when I was instructing, I still didn't have an IFR rating. So I went down to, uh, oh, I think it was pro IFR in uh, Victoria. Yeah, yeah, I've heard of that. And uh <laughs> Yeah, I, I had more hours on twin and teaching in general than the guy teaching me my IFR. But I went down there and in a couple weekends um, finished my IFR rating. And then I was actually able to be employable because quite honestly, yeah, there's there's a few jobs out there in the world that banner towing or um, survey but you know they're they're not the most plentiful jobs basically if you don't have an ifr and you don't want to be an instructor there, there there's maybe a couple jobs available but it's not a good <laughs> you, you have to get your ifr and you have to get it early yeah right on so, so uh okay so you moved out to bc and then you ended up getting your ifr ticket and then what happened after that what was your next job after instructing um, so after I got my IFR, um, I actually got hooked up with a company called Orca Airways and, um, because I had so much time teaching, I had a lot of multi-time, um, the, their job was a single pilot, uh, they, they're a Navajo operator. Mm. Um, and most of it was two crew Navajo, Navajo and chieftains, but, uh, because of my hours, because I had um, basically 100 hours on type already and over 1,000 total that I was actually able to be single pilot IFR. And so they stuck me with an airplane um, in uh, Qualicum Beach on Vancouver Island. And uh, so basically my first job was uh, flying single pilot IFR, flying passengers to and from uh, Vancouver Island to Vancouver South. Holy. So you, you did a bunch of flying out in BC then? Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, I did a fair bit. And then for anybody complaining about their IFR while well, they have to learn NDB approaches and all that stuff is because all the, uh, all the airports that uh, you're flying into out there are all old and archaic. <laughs> um, and what type of plane were you flying then for this single pilot IFR? What was it? So that, uh, yeah. So it was a Navajo chieftain. Okay. Uh, um, so twin 350 horses side, uh, 10, 10 seats. So single pilot, I'd take uh, one person up front with me and, uh, eight more in the back. Wow. Cool. So, and, uh, you moved on from that job as I know a little bit of your, uh, career history here, you moved on from that job and where did you go to after that? Um, I, where, where did I wind up? I went to, um, Alberta and I, uh, got a job with, uh, North Caribou Air flying, um, Dash 8s. Oh, cool. You're just kind of so like I was... make, making your way back across the country slowly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not on purpose, but that's kind of what happened. Um, yeah, I went out to Alberta, uh, um, moved the whole family there, had our first child there. And then uh, I was rated on, um, so I flew the Dash 100, 300s, and the Q400. And I was with them for two years until, where does that take us, 2015, when oil started going for a tank. And uh, that's when I kind of had to reevaluate things. So with this job uh, in Alberta, we were you were math. flying a lot of people into like... Uh, sort of remote locations that worked on like oil rigs and things like that. Yeah, that's exactly it. So every day, so it was like Monday to Friday, um, I was in Calgary and it would be Calgary, Edmonton, 
and then one of the oil sands airports. So not a lot of it was to actual Fort McMurray, like YMM, mm. but most of it was to airports around Fort McMurray because every uh, every oil company had their own airport. Mm. So Canadian Natural Resources, Shell, um, Devon, Jackfish, like they all had their own names that maybe uh, yeah, Devon and whatnot that you wouldn't know, but uh, they all had their own ones. So we would go Calgary with people, pick up more people in Edmonton, and then go to one of those airports do a crew change, drop off people, take on people, go back to Edmonton, back to Calgary, you're done. And so you would have started as a first officer on one of these, uh, on one of the Dash airplanes, and then did you eventually work your way up to captain of one of those planes? No. Um, so yeah, so I, start, I started as a first officer, mm -hmm. and I was still pretty low hours. Um, the, the requirements for a uh, captain in that industry is higher uh, the the oil companies decided that they would make our hour requirements um mm. so yeah kind of kind of a weird concept um but yeah if you were flying for shell you had to be over four thousand hours and, and if you're flying for this company you had to be over this many hours so i stayed so i stayed as a first officer um we were looking at you know i was lining up for doing my upgrade after that two year mark but then that's when everything started to uh, take a downturn so i never uh, never got a chance to uh, get upgraded on the dash and then okay so after you what was the name of this uh sorry I, i've forgotten the name of the company that you were working for in alberta north caribou north caribou so after that then you finally managed to make your way back to ontario or did you stop in manitoba for a job there <laughs> no, um, was was straight to Ontario. Um, yeah, so I had a a roommate. Uh, I, I rented him one of our rooms in Calgary, and uh, he was telling me about the company he used to work for, um, Sky Regional. And I didn't know anything about them, but I fired off a resume when uh, in 2015 when stuff started to go down, and. Um, they they got back to me and they sent me a uh, a package and they wanted to fly me out for the day just for an interview and I said okay, okay. so I'm getting ready to fly out for the day and it wasn't until um, I had looked at their package I'm wondering why all this Air Canada Express stuff is all over it I'm like what is what is this is this Sky Regional or is this uh, is this Air Canada Express because at the time I, I I thought the only Air Canada Express people were basically like Georgian and jazz. Mm. Uh, I, re I didn't even know that Sky Regional existed. Mm. Um, but yeah, then found out, yeah, okay, yeah, that they, uh, uh, an operator for them and came out, did the interview and uh, started work one month after. Started um, a April 20th, uh, 2015 was my start date with uh, Sky Regional. And what did they have you on? Um, so Sky operated both Q400s and the Embraer. So I got put on the uh, Embraer 175. And uh, basically all the routes were um, North America. Not not a lot of Canadian cities. Like 90% was, um, we'd still consider it domestic, but uh, um, short short flights. You know, Toronto to New York City, which is like 55 minutes. All all. A lot of one-hour flights just around uh, the northeastern uh, seaboard and whatnot. And then, uh, so you started as a first officer with them, and then uh, uh, you worked your way up to captain on that airplane, I think, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I was on, I think it was just under or just over two, no, it was a year and a half. Year and a half as first officer on the Embraer, and then um, got bumped up to captain, uh, which is pretty uh, pretty intimidating. Um, made uh, yeah, captain by twenty eight on that thing. Wow! And about how many hours would you have had at this point? Um, I think to get captain, I needed uh, four thousand hours. Wow. To be uh, before they 
put you up uh, to the left seat on in that company. Cool. Uh, right on. Um, so, um, how long were you captain on the airplane for? Um, till August 5th, 2018. August 5th, 2018. Right. And then, uh, obviously something happened in your life that, uh, sort of, well, had a pretty serious impact on your flying career to this point. Um, I think that uh, you had a motorcycle accident. Is that correct? Um, yeah. Yeah. I uh, was a, a sunny Sunday afternoon, and um, I just spent the day with my family at a water park, actually, and was just on a kind of leisurely ride and got uh, T-boned on my uh, motorcycle. All right. So... Uh... I think I was actually, uh, uh, I think I was just down the road at the time when that happened. And I know it, uh, uh, wasn't your fault at all. Somebody turned in front of you. I guess they didn't see you. Would that be accurate? Um, yeah, they, 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 they were turning into a gas station that happened to be on the corner of that, uh, intersection there. And, um, it wasn't so much of a turn in front of, because then I would have gone over the hood. Uh, they actually nailed me directly on the side. Um, so we, we don't need to get into any of the details of what happened and whatnot, <laughs> but uh, obviously uh, it uh, your flying career at that point came to a screeching halt. And um, I'm guessing that... Uh, the reason for that screeching halt was because uh, of your inability, likely after, you know, a fairly serious accident to qualify for a Category 1 medical. Would that be accurate? Yeah, right. that's that's pretty correct. Do you want to tell us a little bit about, you know, just kind of what life has been like after your accident? It's been like two and a half years now That about that, I guess. Yeah, it has been uh, just over two and a half years. Sometimes we forget that we rely on our health to fly these airplanes. And it's not until you can't get a medical certificate anymore that you realize right, how valuable your health is to your livelihood, right? Yeah. So if you have yeah, any, uh, just if you can reflect on the last couple of years and what it's been like and, and uh, just tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, well, since uh, since that day, I've, I've I've had a lot of struggles to uh, to get through. I lost my hearing, I broke my neck, uh, my arm was partially paralyzed, um, concussion, memory problems. So it's been quite the the hurdles. Um, and at the beginning, it was. Well, even now, like I more or less come to terms with my conditions, but, uh, you know, like I've loved flying since I was, well, I started in air cadets at 12, but, <clears throat> you know, I remember my dad taking me to the airport when I was four years old and actually the, he's got a picture of me as a kid sitting in the cockpit of a, of a Piper Cherokee. And that's actually the same plane that I soloed on, uh, 13 years later. Um, and it, it was, it was a lot of withdraw withdrawal, not being able to, you know, us pilots were, we're, we're a certain breed, right? You know, we, we kind of eat, sleep, breathe flying and to have that taken away is kind of brutal to, you know, to have your dreams kind of stripped away like that with a lot of uncertainty of, uh, what's, what the future may have in store um but i've been doing rehabs uh but i do physio weekly i do rehab weekly working on thing on these things to try and get back um and then as you know we, we like to hang out uh at a skydive place where i know you from mm. skydive ontario and and that just gives 
me the ability to kind of keep in touch with aviation, you know, still mm. talk planes with plane people and, and, you know, I can sit in the plane and touch the controls and, you know, I, just so I don't lose all of that feeling, uh, um, you know, all of that love and passion for aviation. <clears throat> but uh, as far as, you know, protecting your medical, um, I do know that there's medical insurance like that covers your medical out there. Um, I've been fortunate that, uh, um, you know, the, the motorcycle in question was my father's and his insurance. He, he, he had extra insurance on it and that's been very helpful during this process um, because they've been taking care of me pr pretty well. But, um, you know, it's, you're flying one day, you know, I had just finished a pairing uh, the day before with uh, a good friend of mine who I was in air cadets with, and then he was my first officer at Sky Regional, and uh, we were in Quebec City, and then the next day you're getting hit by a car, and, you know, that's it. Yeah, I, uh, it's just hard for me to imagine. I know it's been, uh, you know, it's difficult. <clears throat> yeah. To say it's, it certainly hasn't been easy. Definitely puts a lot of things into perspective. Um, family, you know, I, I have a growing family. I have two sons. My son, my second son was actually born the month before my accident. So mm -hmm. I, I'm thankful I've got a pretty, uh, strong wife that, uh, takes care of me you know she was taking care of me while i'm in casts and neck braces as well as also taking care of our newborn son at that time you know it takes a certain kind of woman to be able to do all that for sure so but then I, i'm also thankful you know she's she's airline industry she worked for central mountain air as a customer service agent for seven years um, before i whisked her away to ontario but uh you know, she she under she understood what aviation means to me. She's been around planes lots too, and I'm just thankful that she's so understanding. Right. Well, I guess uh, you know you're you're obviously not going to give up on it, and uh, you know these things take time. And if you stick with it like you did with aviation, then uh, you know hopefully one day things will turn around and you know you might uh, start with a category three medical and at least be able to get back into an airplane and uh, fly yourself personally and then you know as things move forward then you never know you uh, well, hopefully I'm assuming you'd like to eventually have a category one medical back and uh, persistence and and uh, hopefully that happens for you uh, thanks Jamie yeah at this time <clears throat> given everything uh, it's actually kind of looking a little bleaker I'm not sure I will return to flying um, I do have some permanent damage that uh, occurred and but at this point I'm just I just want to stay in touch with aviation you know um, and, and see what happens I know well uh, f for myself, I, like, I had a bit of a similar issue. I, I thought that I wanted to get started on a in aviation at about, uh, oh, I think when I was about 21, I thought that I wanted to get into like rotor wing and whatnot. And then, uh, I went to university and time progressed a little bit. And then I ended up uh, getting diagnosed with something called <laughs> ulcerative colitis. And it's like an intestinal, um, uh, it's a disease of the large intestine. And uh, it in itself won't inhibit you from flying, but um, the medications that you need to take uh, to sort of uh, keep it in check aren't permitted when it comes to getting medicals. And those medications oh. are steroids. So for me, I had to basically postpone it for, oh, it was probably 10 years. And that was the advice of the medical doctor I got until... I figured things out and I got it under control. And then, uh, you know, now I do have my, uh, 
uh, multi CPL with an instructor rating and, uh, I just kind of stuck with it and eventually it happened. So, you know, don't never say never. <laughs> Persistence. <laughs> Cool. Well, um, just one last question here, Steve. Um, so if you could go back and start all over again and, uh, you know, go through your flying career up until uh, the point of your accident, um, you know, not including your accident or anything, is there anything you'd change, anything you do differently? No. You know what? No, it, it's it's all been a lesson, and uh, yeah, actually, yeah, I would get my IFR. <laughs> you would have got it sooner. I'd get that early, but but um, you know, because that that really did ho hold me back from being able to to progress. Because yeah, you can get IFR jobs at five hundred hours. You know, you can start or you know seven hundred fifty hours. You can be looking at right seat in a nineteen hundred for for Georgian. But, uh, you know, here I was 1,200 hours and no IFR, can't get a job other than instructing, you know. Right. But um, I, I would, no, I, I would basically leave everything the same. Um, I, I, I was guilty of the same thing where, you know, I'm not sure if you heard of the term chasing metal before, right? I've never heard that, no. You're, Pushing you're tin, I've heard. you never heard that? Oh. <laughs> Pushing tin. Well, I, you know, and, and we know people who are guilty of it that uh, you always want to move on to the bigger and better thing, right? You know, you're, you're an instructor and you want that Navajo job or, yeah, you, you want to move. Oh, you want right seat on a dash. Oh, you want to go right seat on a 3.7, left seat, 3.7. You know, you're always wanting to move up. And sometimes you want to move up and progress so fast, you know. Some of the funnest jobs I've had were, you know, flying the flying the Chieftain. Um, instructing you know you have a lot more freedom on those smaller airlines but mm. you really need to slow down your career um, you'll get there when you get there you don't want to be jumping honestly I, I, I feel that people who go straight from 200 hours CPL to right seat dash at jazz they're, they're missing out uh, they're not learning as much because there's a whole lot you learn in life and in flying, when you're an instructor, when you're flying, when you're flying those lower end jobs, you're learning a whole lot too. Um, and those were some of the funnest jobs I've ever had. Was you know flying, you know here I am with 1,201 hours flying single pilot IFR, uh, shooting an NDB into Tofino, British Columbia. You know, like some of, that's some of the craziest fun you'll ever have. Yeah, I can imagine. Steve, thanks a lot for talking to me today. And uh, I just hope everything works out for you and you uh, end up back up back in, uh, at least uh, back in the airplane, um, you know, in, in, in some sense, maybe not in Industry. a commercial sense, but, uh, you know, at the, at the bare minimum, at least getting, being able to get back in and, and uh, enjoy flying yourself again. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, I, I just would like to stay in touch, you know, with, with flying. It's, it's a passion. It's, you know, for, for us types, it's more than just a hobby. It's, you know, we eat, sleep, breathe flying airplanes. And I just like to be able to still do that. Still talk planes. Cool. Well, if there's uh, if you think of something else you'd like to talk about in, in an area, let me know and uh, we'll see if we can make it happen. Certainly. Well, thanks, Jamie. Cool, man. Well, you have a good day, and uh, Merry Christmas to you and your family. Happy New Year, and uh, we'll be in touch. All right, perfect. Thanks, Jamie. Merry cool. Christmas. Cool. Thanks again, Steve. Bye-bye. Right, See you, buddy.